Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final Center for Practice Excellence Speaker Series event for 2022. Thank you for joining us today for an important discussion around disruptive innovations to address antimicrobial resistance, a topic of relevance to pharmacists regardless of our practice setting. Let me turn it over to my colleague and our moderator for today's event, Annalise Mathers, to get us started. Annalise. Thanks so much, Subin, and, and welcome to everyone. We're really happy to have people join us today, um, knowing it's getting close to the holidays and that there's lots going on for people. Um, I'd like to just start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm on the land today at the University of Toronto, um, and here for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. From my own path to, to truth and reconciliation, I've personally benefited as a settler from living on this land in Treaty 13 here in Toronto, as well as throughout my education and training on the land in Ottawa and British Columbia. I'm grateful to work towards a deeper understanding of the history that's brought myself and all of us to reside on this land and to work towards creating environments um, of mutual respect and learning. So a few logistical considerations um, for those of us, for those of you who are new or, or regular attendees of our CPE speaker series sessions. Our event today will begin with a presentation by Mark McIntyre um, and followed by remarks from Nathan Beam as our discussant. We'll save the balance of the time as usual, the last 15 minutes or so for audience question and answer. Um, I'll ask that keep, you keep yourself muted just during the presentations, and you can put your questions and comments into the chat, and we'll get to those at the end of today's session. So just before I introduce Mark, um, just want to remark that this event is on the heels of World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, which was November 18th to 24th. And so I think this event feels pretty well timed to have Mark and Nathan um, join us to discuss this really important topic. So Mark, I'll introduce you um, briefly, and then I'll let you get started. Mark has been passionate about the role of antimicrobials in history, society, and healthcare since pharmacy school. Prior to coming to Canada, Mark received his doctorate of pharmacy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. After emigrating to Canada, he practiced in community pharmacy and then completed his general practice pharmacy residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. After finishing residency, Mark has worked at Mount Sinai Hospital and at the University Health Network in the areas of emergency critical and critical care, antimicrobial stewardship, and infectious disease. He's also worked on the areas of policy and regulatory change with, it, with Health Quality Ontario and with OCP. Mark, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise Zubin, and uh, thank you guys for inviting me. Very, very happy to be giving this talk today. I've actually, you have talks that you give because you're like, all right, this is a good topic to give. And I'm just very, very excited to give this talk to you because I think it brings together a lot of different pieces at exactly the right time to talk about this, especially in Ontario. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll have a, a better understanding of what's inside my brain, um, but also what's the landscape of antimicrobial stewardship uh, as in regards to minor ailments and uh, disruptive innovation, because that's kind of what we, we have happening to us right now, but I, I hope to give you a basic background behind the economics of that and how to apply it to antimicrobial stewardship innovation um, going forward, because I think it's time. This is the time. All right. So disclosures, again, member of the OCP Minor Ailments Advisory Group, so that has colored some of this discussion, and I've put in a lot of my heart and soul into this discussion in Ontario. Um, I do educational consulting on the side, nothing that would impact this discussion or anything like it, but the full disclosure. And uh, yes, that was me in the unicorn costume. Um, the other thing is, like, I'm trying to strike a balance here between academically fulsome discussion and also some entertainment, uh, because I think it is it is a, a big topic, and I think we have to break this off in a way that culturally shifts practice as opposed to just discrete entities of data. Um, and I've got a really interesting particular set of skills, and uh, I'm going to invite you into this discussion in, in an open mind. I don't think I have all of the answers here. I don't think I know everything it is about your area of practice or how this should work in the next two months, five years, 10 years, but I think this is a good place to start. And so all I'll ask of you is just an open mind to keep this in a way that is possible and positive and uh, thinking about the ideas as they come to you. So our key questions that I think we should address today are what are what is antimicrobial stewardship and why should pharmacists care? The second is what is disruptive innovation and how it can impact AMS activities in community practice? 
And uh, in what practical ways can stewardship be applied to community pharmacy settings? And I'll start really briefly, what is antimicrobial stewardship? So the federal government, along with the WHO or in alignment with the WHO, has published a couple uh, framework for how to approach antimicrobial resistance around the world and now in Canada with a specific government publication from 2017. And it highlights four pillars that showcase how we can address antimicrobial resistance as a healthcare system, as society at large. And those pillars include infection prevention and control, surveillance, uh, research and innovation, but importantly for us, antimicrobial stewardship. And what antimicrobial stewardship is, is a coordinated series of activities or set of activities designed to promote, improve, monitor, and evaluate um, judicious antimicrobial use and to preserve it for future uh, patients and for future society. And why should we care about this? Because this is a lot of mumbo jumbo jargon and high level stuff that, you know, 20 years down the road might make a difference. But in truth, it's actually making a difference right now. And uh, so there was a publication in The Lancet earlier this year that showcases around the world about 5 million people every year die either with or because of or with antimicrobial resistant organisms. And that's now. That's not in 20 years. That's That was 2019 data. So 5 million people every year. Um, and that's abstract in a world of 8 billion people. That's you know important and impactful and sad, but also hard to fathom. But if you bring it down to Canada, the CARS report, um, the Canadian Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance uh, System report, just came out. And it showcases about 15,000 Canadians every year die of or with antimicrobial resistant infection. So right here at home, that is a substantial total of people every year. And if you look at this and try to extrapolate it, even not accounting for climate change and other type of factors, by uh, 30 years from now, we're looking at about more people than cancer every year dying from antimicrobial resistant infections. And more importantly, right now, if you look at your, if you're in a pharmacy right now, just look behind you. Do you see any amoxicillin suspension? No, you don't. And I guarantee you this is not because there's a rip roaring strep pneumo um, outbreak going on or there's group A strep circulating everywhere. Absolutely, there's more of it than there was in the pandemic, but this is not a result. This backorder situation is not a result of actual bacterial infection, but a response to an infection. And so hopefully putting in stewardship principles where it matters most can help mitigate some of these issues going forward. And the big thing to take home is that antimicrobial use in humans and animals and agriculture is the primary driver for antimicrobial resistance. And it's in large part modifiable. And the crazy part is like, I come from the hospital environment. I practice a community setting of practice in the hospital. Um, and we have put so much resource around the world and in Ontario into hospital antimicrobial stewardship programs. But the reality is 90% of all antimicrobial use is in the outpatient setting, 50% or so by community practitioners, um, about the other 50% made up of a variety of people we'll talk about in a second. And the target conditions for this really are the, the, big, the, the big seven, really. So sinusitis, otitis media, urinary tract infections, bronchitis, or various other non-pneumonia respiratory tract conditions, pneumonia, pharyngitis, and cellulitis. And that's it. Like, it doesn't have to be a huge laundry list. We're not looking at rickettsial disease, by and large. We're not looking at malaria. It sometimes happens. But the big drivers are going to be these seven conditions. And the top four are really going to take about 60 to 70%. And those include otitis media. Uh, uh, pneumonia, UTI, and sinusitis. So who's doing this? Who, who, is, who is prescribing these things? Um, so if you take all the physicians in Canada, about 92,000 or so, 91,000, all the GPs, about 4,300, 4,300, uh, For pharmacists, it's hard to get exact data here because places like Alberta, Nathan, don't publish their exact split. Um, but based on uh, most current data from 2022, somewhere about 35,000 practicing community pharmacists out there. But there are no dedicated antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists or really any dedicated antimicrobial stewardship clinicians, period, in the community setting. And keep in mind, not just prescribers are not just, um, we always think about, you know, do something different, talk to the prescribers, talk to the prescribers, target the prescribers. But in reality, as we go forward, there's a plurality of people prescribing antimicrobials. And so targeting a specific group like family physicians is great, 
but it doesn't address the issue. So we've got dentists, we've got nurse practitioners, we've got pharmacists, we've got veterinarians, podiatrists, uh, midwives, a lot of different people who are prescribing. And it's important to have the common denominator addressing some of these issues. So who sees every single prescription for antimicrobials before it's taken? This one pharmacist, just her, nobody else. No, I'm kidding. Pharmacists see every single prescription for antimicrobials before they're taken. So it, there's a there's a, a an obvious uh, synergy between what needs to happen and who's seeing it, and we just have to figure out ways to leverage that. So hopefully, in the next you know 15, 20 minutes, we'll see some of how we can start to move on this and how we can conceptualize change in in regards to improvement of antimicrobial prescribing. Okay, so obvious this is something that not just I have thought about, nor just everybody else who I, who's working at a reference, but somebody else has thought about this. And yeah, it's true. The CDC has thought about this. They put in some um, action items in place. There's a pretty good report about the core elements of antimicrobial stewardship in the community setting. And there's a lot of great stuff in there. There's uh, trending, looking at data, looking at uh, sort of actionable things that you can really grab onto and go with. Um, where are the pharmacists? Not there. So the report really uses pharmacists as a triage tool to appropriately send people to, to healthcare uh, provision of, of a different level or to not. Um, they might be able to provide educational training. Um, there might be sort of timely access to people with expertise as defined by this guidance, but there's really a, a dearth of um, a dearth of pharmacist understanding or, or places where pharmacists could be used. And there's a pretty good reason for that. So brief history lesson, huge fan of history, especially history of medicine and pharmacy. So if you look back about, you know, forever, um, pharmacies as a pharmacy as a dedicated profession was in existence in the Middle East for a very long time. Um, you know, pharmacies, even up into sort of Southern Europe, there, there were actual dedicated pharmacies in the seventh century. Um, but it really took until about 1240, where the Edict of Palermo, Palermo was signed by Ferdinand II, that said, nope, we're going to separate medicine and pharmacy because of the conflict of interest, and we'll have people who dis prescribe and people who dispense. And from 1240 until about now-ish, we've been along the same trajectory. So we had individual pharmacy practitioners, and then we had conglomerations and more standardization of pharmacy practice into the 1800s and the 1900s. Um, and then we get into the true pharmaceutical industry time where we aren't compounding, but we're providing uh, medications to patients and then providing expertise to patients. And then we get into the pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical care paradigm. And so we've just tra traversed about 700 years or so of, of time in pharmacy. And what this has led to is the current model. So we've got, you know, prescription in, prescription out, and everything else gets fit around that. And that's true you know, 50 years ago, that's true today. The difference is that things have gotten busier. I don't know if you've recognized that, but you're vaccinating, you're taking care of patients, you're taking care of customers, you're taking care of clinical questions, you're bringing people out. Um, now you're going to do minor ailments prescribing. And it just seems like maybe this is an unsustainable model for people going forward with the current situation and setup. It feels a little like Jenga. And so we're talking about how does stewardship clinic, how does stewardship roll into community? But the title of the talk really is how do we disrupt pharmacy practice or how do we disrupt stewardship practice so it actually works with pharmacy? Or how do we disrupt the profession? How do we change the pharmacy, pharmacy profession to actualize what training we have and uh, the insight we have to make stewardship a priority? And so I don't think it's, a, this isn't a simple just, hey guys, here's something new you should do, do it. My goal at the end of this lecture is really to have you understand where we can actually shift the profession and shift stewardship to meld together in a way that facilitates practice and isn't just an add-on to your day-to-day -day routine. Okay, so I'm I'm not an economist. I am somebody who dabbles in a lot of different things, but I really find this a very fascinating discussion. And there, there are books about this, um, but there's a really, really concise article in the Harvard Business Review, Review that discusses disruptive innovation. And really briefly, it's the process by which a smaller company, usually uh, with fewer resources, moves up market and challenges a larger established business. And you're like, well, yeah, maybe, possibly. Bear with me. You'll see what I mean. There's two different types of disruptive innovation. There's the sort of low-end disruption, where you've got somebody who is kind of developing and, and uh, working on their own in a lower end market without a lot of uh, compensation, a lot of a lot of return on investment. 
and you can think about this in a couple of different ways. You can think about this like Hyundai in the 1990s, where they're kind of like doing their own thing with low quality cars and gradually building up the capacity to make better automobiles until right now, they are kind of the, the leading stylistic and uh, value add experts in a luxury market. So they've really taken this upmarket push and have become a disruptive innovator because they're putting pressure on established brands like Mercedes or Lexus or what have you. So they, they are low end disruptors here. But if you think about minor ailments, it's actually a, a similar story. If you think about how um, in the States, especially small medical clinics adjunct to retail outlets have really taken the place of a lot of uh, family physician's offices or, or walk-in clinics. Urgent care is the same way. If you are willing to uh, go to these places, which are generally closer to your home with less of a wait time, you can kind of shave the top off a lot of those things you would need to go to your family physician for or emergency for. And it adds a uh, convenience factor and, and a re reduced cost for the same amount of service provision. And if you look at minor ailments in the most economically objective way, that's kind of what we're doing. We're providing kind of convenient, low cost option for things that are very common and easy to manage in a way that benefits patients and society. And I don't need to erode our credibility or our clinical acumen or skill, but I think this is where this is what's happening. And basically, let's go to the pharmacist for free medical advice. Whether or not the government is going to live up to that, who knows? We'll see what happens. But anyway, uh, I digress. When it comes to antimicrobial stewardship in pharmacy, it's a slight different sh uh, shift. And this is more of a new market disruption. Because what we're really trying to do is uh, using, using a different strategy, actually develop a market de novo. Nobody has this market yet. Nobody thinks about this market yet. But there's an opportunity, I think, for us as pharmacists who are drug experts, who are antimicrobial experts, who see all of these prescriptions and understand this stuff to develop our own strategy and own it. The opportunity and the challenge though is that humans only invest in things they can understand, they can value, and they can really play a part in or control. And up to this point, I think we all see prescriptions for you know 14 days of amoxicillin, and you're like, yeah, that's not probably not right, but um, I got a counter full of red baskets here and phone calls and I, I just can't do it. And so I get it, I totally understand. But I think there are ways we can, you know, change the approach to stewardship, especially as it is applied to community practice that will help us do both things at once, improve our, our possible practice model and improve antimicrobial usage across the board. And as we take this journey, there are a lot of things that can guide us. And, you know, from 2017 uh, on to about now, there's been a huge uptick the amount of community pharmacy practice papers or opinion pieces or ways to consider this approach. And I think the biggest highlight that I'll pull from this particular quote is that we are accessible. Everybody knows that. You can walk into a pharmacy anywhere in Ontario and have medical advice given to you or, or ask a question about a medication. And we can do this in individual approaches with clinicians or with patients, but we can also do this in le uh, leveraging other types of interventions. Sorry, I haven't moved enough. Um, anyway, I'll use the use the uh, light from the window. So we can leverage this by figuring out ways to harness campaigns and to get umbrella terms to garner support for the idea. And so this, you know, stewardship as a intervention, a coordinated series of interventions is really the key here. It's not just one-off discussions about individual pieces with prescribers or with patients it should be all housed under an umbrella with the same overarching goal. And that can help be, uh, start the conversation and continue the conversation and reinforce ideas of stewardship as we go forward. Okay, so let's look at some data and really briefly go into kind of what's been done currently, or what is done currently and what's kind of on the horizon or in the future. Um, and what can we actually practically do right now to get antimicrobials improve, uh, use improved in community practice? So how do pharmacists currently feel about antimicrobial stewardship? I'm talking about it, it's a novel idea, but there is work out there and people do think about this stuff. So what data What data exists? Um, are there examples of interventions in the pharmacy practice environment right now that are existing? And uh, kind of what can we do to get, uh, to get to where, what comes next? How can we put that next flag in? How can we really take this on as our own thing and not a response? Okay, so I'm going to break this down in a, from a literature perspective, two different ways. 
We've got survey studies and we've got qualitative studies. And then I'll show you a couple intervention studies. Um, and I, I think Nathan will be speaking a little bit more on that. So probably the biggest study about this particular global approach to antimicrobial stewardship in community pharmacy came from 2019. And it was published by Saha et al. looking at 10 different studies or survey studies around the world. And majority were either from Australia, the UK, one from Canada, one from Pakistan, a couple of, from Ethiopia and, and uh, some somewhere of Africa as well, um, and I believe Malaysia. And what they were asking is really, what, what's your approach? What's your understanding? Have you heard this term before? Um, what are the things that you do or don't do with antimicrobial stewardship? And long story short, the table one of this is that, that we love it. Everything's great. Stewardship is fantastic. Everybody wants to do it. Um, and that's true for anything that seems like a, on face a great idea. Um, but then you break, down, break it down a little bit more and say, okay, what specifically can we actually do about this? And when you ask the question or when you look at this paper and, and see what people actually do, a lot of it's collaboration with prescribers, which is fantastic. There are pra collaborative practice models with GPs in the UK that have worked really well for years. Um, there's patient education, very important, very, very you know, practical and, and implicit to what we do as pharmacists on a daily basis. And then there's the dis dispensing process activities, making sure that people know how to take medications, what to do with them, um, how long to take them for, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the AMS campaign participation. So at World Antimicro Antimicrobial Awareness Week, which just passed, um, flu campaigns, things like that. When you drive down into the barriers and facilitators of what stewardship is in community practice, there are a couple of key things that um, kind of pop out at you, which I think you'll be able to see and understand from your own experience. So some of the barriers that were seen in this paper were bit, uh, sort of training barriers, uh, lab and uh, and patient data, um, the uh, the idea of sort of relationship with GPs or lack of relationship with GPs, um, and uh, sort of um, you know connection overall, time constraints and uh, reimbursement models, and uh, you know the, the role definition as well. So this is unsurprising. I think most people would understand this is a, a barrier. Some facilitators though are just getting content knowledge out there. There's low hanging fruit that we can give people and getting that into, into play is important. Engagement, uh, sort of public awareness overall, guidelines and sort of lab data access, what, you know, sort of not flying blind here is really important. So that was like the, the benchmark set for what's happening around the world. Couple studies, let's put them all together, see what's happening. And then using that, the same approach or a similar approach, uh, the same author group, decided, okay, let's do this in our home country and gave a national survey to Australia that was very comprehensive and well done. And this came out in 2021. Um, so they did a national study, had about a 30% response rate, 612 people. And we're really asking, uh, are, people, are pharmacists aware of this? How can they uh, interact with it? What things do they need? And, and what things that are, are barriers to them? And what you find when you look at this study is that most pharmacists are aware of the concept. Most people think they need more training. And um, the second bullet point here is really saying, can my efforts, I, I don't think my efforts can actually impact overall antimicrobial resistance. That was, that was a low, so that's a good sign. Most people are on board with this, this idea. There's, this is not, there's not pushback. Most people are supportive of it. And I think most of all people find potential value in antimicrobial use and societal cost as a result of this. And when you look at sort of what the pharmacists do and, and how comfortable they feel doing them, um, unsurprisingly, pharmacists feel comfortable doing pharmacist things. They feel very comfortable counseling patients, talking to patients about appropriate use, duration, um, symptom improvement, all the things we do every day for counseling. Pharmacists are very comfortable with that. They feel less comfortable when you're assessing adherent to prescribing guidelines or starting to make that comment on appropriateness or saying this is good or this is maybe not so good. And we're patient pharmacists are much less comfortable is actually bringing this to physicians and saying, hey, this is not something uh, we feel is appropriate. And I think when we talk about the idea of like stewardship and community, we've all been there. We've all had this experience where you're like, I know this probably isn't right, but I don't want to call this person and get yelled at to not have anything change. And so right now, I think there's a lot of opportunity to educate people but not push against their, their either innate or, or understood and learned um, 
processing that they have psychologically. They're, we don't want to have to make pharmacists hang their entire professional understanding or daily practice models out to dry because we're asking them to do stewardship. We need to find something that works with this type of a response and doesn't require people to make phone calls, brave phone calls every single day to do stewardship. It's just not going to work. But ultimately, when they ask, you know, do you think this is something we could do? Everybody loves it. So if this is something that, in theory, people really like doing. People, pharmacists are on board with. When it comes to the practical stuff, people don't know exactly how to crack the nut. And they're uncomfortable going into relationships or, or establishing type of dialogue in relationships that have both a knowledge deficit and a power dynamic issue. And I think that's something to take for as we go forward with stewardship in community practice. How do we address those things? We don't want to just try to cram this thing down into you know square peg round hole. We want to find things that are going to work in that setting. Um, when you look at the sort of fuller understanding about barriers and um, opportunities in community pharmacy practice for stewardship, you can do this in a way that facilitates a little bit um, sort of a, a deeper dive. And this is a paper out of the UK uh, that is just right up my alley. Like I think about things that I enjoy talking about and thinking about, um, talking about the motivators for people's you know, understanding that uh, sort of um, decision-making processes and why they change their behavior is so interesting to me. And that's really why I like doing stewardship because you're a salesperson, a psychologist, and a pharmacist all rolled into one at any given time. This particular study kind of put in a couple different areas uh, that may be uh, antimicrobial stewardship adjacent in addition to AMR and AMS in community practice. And I won't focus on the self-care and antimicrobial adherence issue. If you're interested in this paper, please feel free to pull it up and read it. It's a great read. I, do, I will pull out some of the themes that came out from the AMR and AMS in community practice. And I know, like when I think about this, we can use combi models and TDFs to craft not just what we can do as pharmacists, um, but why we could do it. Why, if we put this inter in intervention in place, would it actually lead to a change? And I think we, it's very helpful within our profession to think about not just what we can do, but why it would work, to what magnitude, what things can we put in to facilitate that practice change and whether we anticipated barriers. Um, it's, it's sort of psychological and behavioral change management. But starting that up front is very, very helpful. So I'm glad to see this done early on in this idea of community practice stewardship. Busy slide, I'm gonna unpack it in a second, but what they noticed are a couple different things that I'll highlight. And what they pulled out were the themes that were barriers to implementation of those three, three things that we talked about before, um, self-care, uh, individual um, antimicrobial adherence or medication adherence and AMS and AMR. And focusing just on the AMS and AMR domains, what they found is that for a pharmacist in, in a barrier perspective, time is, is a big issue. And we all know that, like we all work. It doesn't get less busy. It only gets more busy. There's not infinite resources and we're all strapped doing multiple different things. And this is a big cognitive load. I think when you think about um, you know, a process that you can start and finish easily, stewardship doesn't seem to be one of those things. It's not something that you can unpack and say, okay, we're going to fix this prescription and then move on to the next thing. It always seems bigger. And again, time is an important factor. We're not going to get more resources. We're not going to get more time. So how do we change the approach to stewardship to get better outcomes? Um, the concern here in the study is that misinformation could be given to patients. Um, they're unaware of a link between giving information and AMR. Uh, patient diagnosis isn't often available, and it's unclear if the pharmacist um, role is to sort of query or, or question the antimicrobial prescription in terms of appropriateness or, or outcome. And some of the solutions they used after they mapped this to TDF and to the COMB model um, are multi multifocal, and I really encourage you to read this paper if you're interested in this environment. But resources, um, you know, you can say, let's get more resources here, but you need to have a commensurate model that will justify that. So compensation is important. You want to provide standardized material to patients. Um, so that, that idea of like misinformation and the translation of information can be very concise and very accurate. Um, training on AMR, AMS, and how that actually impacts each other. So how, do community, how can community pharmacists actually help the broader goal? We talked about that phrase where you don't value something that you can't control or don't understand. So providing pharmacists with that insight and with that education can really help them um, 
initiate these events. Uh, providing diagnostic, di di sorry, diagnoses on prescription, um, that's something that we've talked about for a long time when it comes to, um, you know, pharmacy inpatient. And then as an outpatient, I think it's equally, if not more important. And we'd like to provide training on assessment as well. So this is something as, as pharmacists in Ontario, we're very much focusing on right now. We're, we're wondering how can we accurately and quickly and efficiently assess people for minor ailments when we haven't necessarily all been trained the same way or to the same extent by, about this. All right, so that's it. Like in a very, very brief 10 minute nutshell, we've gone through pretty much all of this sort of how do pharmacists feel about uh, antimicrobial stewardship and community. That's the sum total of it. There's not a lot, there's some good insight and there's some stuff coming out quick recently, but um, that's it. And when it comes to interventions that are dedicated antimicrobial stewardship interventions in the community sphere, there's really not much there. There's not a lot of sort of dedicated, we're gonna do a stewardship activity. Um, I got really excited when this paper came out, BJOP, uh, February of this year. I was like, oh my gosh, systematic literature review and meta-analysis of pharmacist-led interventions to optimize use of antimicrobials. This is my jam. Um, but when you actually look at it, it's adherence. It's patient-level adherence to antimicrobial therapy. And that has a big role to play in efficacy, but it doesn't really get to the root cause of what we're trying to achieve with stewardship, which is optimal outcomes for all patients. This is a very important part of it, but unfortunately it still leaves us in the under construction mode for initiatives that antimicrobial stewardship is, is trying to address. But let's meld the worlds together. We have antimicrobial prescribing coming in, we have independent minor ailments prescribing coming in, and we have this need to do stewardship. So how do we make this work together? Um, so Julie Wu, uh, Val, uh, Val Young from PHO, a bunch of other people who work closely, uh, I work closely with and have the fortune of doing so, um, put together a systematic review uh, back when we were doing the OCP minor ailments um, approach. And we really wanted to see not just how do pharmacists do this stuff, but how do we do it from an antimicrobial stewardship lens? And when you unpack these studies, you have 14 different studies that have looked at some aspect of pharmacists prescribing for minor ailments. And the vast majority of those are looking at either UTI or pharyngitis or kind of a mix and smattering of all of these things. Um, I'll, I'll discuss a couple of these in very, very minor detail for time's sake, but most of these are going to be either non-randomized control trials or observational designs um, or interventions, but without a comparator group. So there's a lot of stuff here. There are a lot, a lot of trials, but there's not a lot of sort of high quality literature that can really be practice changing apart from uh, Nathan's study that we'll talk about next. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity to assess where can pharmacists fit in and what can we really do with minor ailments to focus on stewardship activity. And uh, for brevity's sake, I'm not going to go through this, but this is a um, one of, I think, Julie and Val's great ideas in this paper was really under, unpacking not just what was seen, but what aspects were looked at in each trial. And I think from a systematic review perspective and methodologically, this provides a lot of insight into what's there and what's not there when it comes to the available literature for community um, pres pharmacists prescribing focused on antimicrobial stewardship. Last, but by no means least, the things that the individual studies that are gonna be highlighted. So this is the route map study. Nathan Beam is the, is the first author in the study and he'll be the respondent for this uh, session. So I'm, I'm hopeful he'll be able to provide a lot more detail here. But by and large, what this study found is that when pharmacists prescribe for UTI or physicians prescribe for UTI, the clinical outcomes are the same, meaning test of cure or treatment, it, uh, cure at, at two weeks is about 90%. Um, pharmacists are just a lot better at following rules and sticking to algorithms, specifically using things like nitrofurantoin and not using fluoroquinolones when given the opportunity. As another example of an intervention that actually got published after our, um, our meta-analysis or systematic review, this is the UK sore throat test and treat program that was published in 2020 with a couple other publications focusing on the pharmacist aspect and the patient aspect of both satisfaction and outcome. And what this really showed is that most people who get assessed by a pharmacist within the community setting are can absolutely be treated and assessed appropriately and treated and given antibiotics or referred uh, referred home or to another uh, service if appropriate. So there is opportunity here for pharyngitis. There's this is not the only literature. This is just the most current literature. So let's just pause and just take a step back and say, where are we right now? 
that's that's the literature as it stands. There are a lot of things that pharmacists are are um, about to do in Ontario. We're about to harness this thing that hasn't really been seen since about the 1200s. We're going to start doing minor ailments prescribing. How do we make sure we do this in a way that's consistent with the values and preferences of stewardship and still not overly onerous on the people who are providing that care? And I think the thing I'd like to focus on here is actually something that we we put out in about 2017 in OCP. And it was really an approach to the construct to how do you approach um, stewardship decision-making in, in the community setting. And what I'd like to focus your attention on are the proactive strategies that you can really use to help us understand what stewardship can be. We don't want to start revamping your entire practice model or focus on stewardship as the only thing you do because we know there's so many other things we do. But there are things that we already do that really are stewardship. And there are things that we can do that we can put a lens or a spin on to say that this is all now under the umbrella of stewardship. Vaccinations, we're trying to prevent influenza infection, which might prevent inappropriate antimicrobial prescribing or secondary bacterial infections, but then would cause antimicrobial prescribing. Patient education, relationship building engagement, um, beta-lactam allergy skin testing, maybe that we should do a, you know allergy assessment day in Ontario. There are a lot of different things we can do proactively that aren't that putting you at the end of a prescription in a, with a sick patient that then has to make a decision on how do I approach this patient at the moment? There are absolutely things we can do to improve that, but that's like the highest stress, um, biggest, lowest yield intervention. So if you're into the full reactive mode, I don't think we're gonna be able to get a big headway made here. It's gonna put more onus on the pharmacist to do things that are a little more uncomfortable. But going a little bit farther forward, how do we, how do we make this better? Um, so I think we need to think about data. Pharmacists have the unique opportunity to have collaborative relationships with physicians in a sort of uh, geographically normal way, meaning that you just have a, you have a catchment. You have a catchment of people. If you're in rural Ontario, if you're in urban Ontario, you have clinicians you see all the time. You get a good understanding of how they prescribe. Um, if there are themes, if we can provide you themes, if there's same themes you notice, this is probably, it's better to, you know, get data in aggregate than it is to call somebody out in the moment because they're always going to be busy and stressed. But if you can schedule a meeting to review data or to talk about data or to think about how we can build these strategies in over the long term, it's a bigger, better use of your time and uh, less likely to be met with, I don't have time or this is garbage. Um, try to do this strategically. And there are some types of um, some types of approaches that will help us do that. Um, you know, I think feelings too, like I you know it's ironic, but if you don't understand why people are doing what they're doing, you're never going to be able to change the behavior. And we're so focused as pharmacists on give people the information and they'll make the decisions. If you build it, they will come. But time after time, are, are, that's proven incorrect. We have to think about how people feel about this stuff, what their beliefs about consequences might be. How do we inter introduce um, alternate strategies or alternate narratives that supports them through that feeling of uncertainty and unease? So this is something that pharmacists can do. We see this, we understand this, we, we can be empathetic about it, but there are opportunities that go beyond just what we're, what we're doing right now. So wrapping up, what, when will then be now? When is this stuff gonna happen? When are we gonna come to fruition? Well, like January 1st is gonna be our time where we can start prescribing without full knowledge about how we're gonna be compensated, without great training if everybody hasn't done that yet. I don't think this is gonna be a rapid uptick. But I think as we do it, it'll be very important to understand where pharmacists are feeling comfortable, where they're not feeling comfortable, and then how they're doing with prescribing, because uh, this, this is going to be our baby. So hopefully by the end, hopefully I've given you some understanding about um, antimicrobial stewardship, what it is, why disruptive innovation might be a thing that we can use both within the profession and within healthcare at, at large. And then uh, what practical ways can pharmacists really start to think about this and move on it and put this all into one umbrella of stewardship, even if they're not sort of stewardship interventions right now, it can kind of build on that toward the, to the future. So um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I will try to turn my lights back on and uh, let Nathan take over. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, and thanks for, for such a thoughtful summary of, of so much of what what's out there in terms of the literature and, and practice right now. And um, some ideas of where we might be headed. Um, Nathan, I'd love to introduce you now to provide some remarks on Mark's presentation and beyond. Um, Nathan Beam completed his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy at the University of Saskatchewan and Doctor of Pharmacy at the University of Alberta. He then completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in pharmacy practice research with the EpiCorps Center at the University of Alberta. 
Currently, he's an assistant clinical professor with the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at U of A. Nathan also has a part-time clinical practice at the Outpatient Parenteral Antimicrobial Therapy Clinic in Edmonton. A primary focus of his teaching and research is in the areas of infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship, and a particular interest of his is in utilizing pharmacists to optimize antimicrobial usage and patient care, particularly in the outpatient setting. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for that. <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for that uh, intro, uh, Annalise, and um, thanks also for in asking me to come and uh, be part of this session. Um, so thanks to you and and to, to Zubin for that, as, and also thanks very much to. Mark for that very excellent um, discussion and summary of uh, why this is important and some very important considerations around how we can potentially look at doing some of these things. And uh, I guess I'll just start very generally by saying I think it's no secret to anybody that uh, antimicrobial resistance is a real concern um, and antimicrobial stewardship interventions are you know, very important um, and, and very necessary to maintain this, if you, if you want to call it a precious resource of, of antibiotics or antibacterials um, uh, to, to preserve, um, you know, a lot of the, the medical advances, I guess, that you can say that we have uh, that, and, and a lot of the things that we, that we take kind of for granted right now. So being able to do a lot of uh, procedures and, um, and uh, surgeries and things like that um, is very much, uh, and, and transplantations and chemotherapy are all kind of hinge on our ability to treat and or prevent infections that arise from those, from those conditions. So um, it's a very real reality that we could kind of um, become uh, in, in an area where those aren't, aren't available to us. So, so these interventions are very important. And uh, as, as, as Mark mentioned, uh, you know, most of this prescribing does happen, um, at least in the the patient care world in the community setting, of course, um, but appropriately, it was highlighted that, uh, you know, veterinarians uh, and I guess agricultural use, I guess you could also add in there, are also important drivers of antimicrobial resistance and things that need to be considered. So we all actually have a role to play in antimicrobial stewardship, um, including clinicians, including patients, and including the general, the general population, right? Um, so, you know, education campaigns kind of targeting the general population could be could be also valuable interventions. But um, looking at within clinicians, uh, as Mark mentioned, who sees, uh, you know, every single prescription uh, that one pharmacist, uh, all the all the all the pharmacists uh, do see all the do do see the the prescriptions that that happen in the in the community setting, and they are well positioned to potentially look at different interventions to improve those things. So. Um, so I would say that, um, that even though most interventions for, um, antimicrobial stewardship, as Mark mentioned, uh, do happen in the institutional setting, um, the community setting is definitely an area where this, um, needs to happen, but, it, uh, is kind of one of the more challenging areas for this to happen for a variety of reasons. A lot of them, which Mark mentioned, a lot of them just because of the sort of disconcertedness and silos that kind of happen in that, in that area, right? So. Um, but what, is, what was appropriately mentioned is that there are lots of things that are kind of already happening that could be considered antimicrobial stewardship, even though they're not formalized. And, um, and I think that's important to note that there are a lot of important things happening already around prevention of infections, around um, uh, things like uh, educating either other clinicians or patients around appropriate antibacterial usage. These are things that are already happening. Um, what perhaps it could have an additional benefit is, is if there is a mechanism uh, in the community that's kind of similar to what happens in, in hospital where there's sort of a, um, interventions from pharmacists to optimize that, uh, that either, either through collaboration with the prescriber or through perhaps pharmacists taking ownership of, of, of making that change themselves, which I can talk about in a moment. And that kind of relates to what was done in the roadmap study. Um, so, um, and I, I guess I'll also say that I, I agree as well with what was said around um, how a single intervention is unlikely to have kind of a sustained out, um, effect. And we've seen studies that do suggest that, that, you know, a single intervention, whether, and especially if they're more passive interventions, such as um, provider education, they tend to have a short-term effect, tends to not be perhaps as large as we would like. And then it also doesn't tend to be sustained unless you continually provide that education, right? Um, 
what is more likely to be beneficial is a combination of antimicrobial stewardship interventions, and especially if they include some active interventions, so things like um, prospective auditing feedback, or uh, in the case of what that might look like in the community pharmacy, pharmacists uh, taking ownership for that and either, like I said, trying to uh, optimize the prescription by contacting the prescriber, or if they're able to, um, assessing the patient and, and optimizing the therapy themselves. So we have evidence, uh, as, as uh, Mark kind of alluded to from the roadmap trial, and, and um, in, in particular that shows that pharmacists are very guideline concordant. So the fact that pharmacists are getting more involved with um, prescribing for antimicrobials and for, for a bunch of different interventions, that alone actually kind of um, would indicate that um, that stewardship is kind of going to get better. Like that alone is kind of a stewardship intervention as well. If pharmacists are accessing care for this from a pharmacist and they're more likely to be guideline concordant, then um, then you could say that the that prescribing is more likely to be uh, appropriate and less likely to select for resistance. Um, and you hear hear that all the time. That's there's a whole bunch of things that uh, that other disciplines uh, will always raise uh, whenever this comes up. And many of you probably seen it in social media lately. Uh, again, it seems to come up all the time. Every time there's a news article about pharmacists prescribing, there's a bunch of stuff coming out from people saying, "Is this effective and safe? Pharmacists doing this? Do you have the training to do this?" Um, is, is antimicrobial resistance going to go through the roof because uh, prescribing is going to be inappropriate and then we keep having to defend ourselves, which is very unfortunate. Um, but we do have some evidence that we can put, point to that it is effective and safe. That, um, so we, we do have evidence showing that, um, that the effectiveness, safety, um, patient satisfaction is, is all very good for, for pharmacists getting involved with UTIs in particular, but also a couple other um, conditions as was mentioned. And I, I would say that uh, that we know that pharmacist prescribing is going to be very uh, very important antimicrobial stewardship interventions. But a very potentially intriguing option is pharmacists prescribing to optimize um, therapy that came from physicians. So um, so the route map trial did show that 95% of pharmacists um, prescriptions, uh, pharmacists initiated prescriptions for uh, antibacterials for UTI were guideline concordant as, as compared to 35% for physicians. And of the physicians that were uh, physician initiated orders that were guideline discordant, just under half of pharmacists prescribed to optimize, um, to optimize that regimen. And um, we can talk about the, re the reasons why they may have not done that more than that, because uh, that was one, one of the things we were encouraging them to do in the study was to do that. And actually a lot of them hadn't even thought of that until we thought to do that until we proposed that in the, in the study that you could just prescribe to, to uh, optimize these things, you know. Um, and a lot of them took it and, and, and did very well with it, but there were some that were more hesitant. Um, and we can talk about the reasons for that. And some of the reasons are what Mark kind of mentioned around historical practices and discomfort with things like that. There are strategies to, to optimize that. Um, and those come to around documentation. I've, I've talked about this with uh, students and pharmacists a lot that, you know, making your documentation a very airtight as to what your assessment was, the reasons why you're changing that prescription and, um, and, and, and all the checks and balances that you went through and, and kind of making it as undeniable as possible, then you're more likely to have physician buy-in to things like that. And actually they'll come to appreciate that and that you've told them why they're doing that because, um, uh, when when patients go to walk-in clinics and other other prescri prescribers do whatever for their patient, they often don't get a note as to what happened. Um, certainly, um, depending on the setting and the scenario, so they some prescribers, uh, at least I've, I've heard of this in Alberta a lot. When pharmacists send them a note of their assessment and what what change they've made and why they've done it, they are actually very appreciative of that. And um, it's also very helpful for pharmacists to follow up, which is something that they or make a plan to follow up and do it because that's something that they've historically maybe not been quite as, as strong with because that's one thing I think that some physicians or other disciplines might be concerned about that they're going to have to follow up or who's going to do the follow-up. So if you tell them that you're going to follow up on it, then you're also more likely to have buy-in. So we can talk about some other <laughs> um, potential uh, barriers and strategies that we saw in route map, but really um, that is an intriguing option. And we found that, that, uh, that there was no difference in effectiveness when pharmacists prescribed to optimize the disc guideline discordant treatment uh, compared to those that did not. Um, and so those that chose not to correct it, there was no significant difference in, in clinical cure uh, in, those, in those patients. So um, I think it's something that is very intriguing option, a very intriguing option um, because we know that's uh, you know, kind of more directed at, at where some of the issues maybe lie. 
Um, but the challenge might be getting pharmacists comfortable with doing that, of course. And it certainly doesn't mean that that's the only way they can they can optimize therapy. There's there's other ways as well. But uh, if it's a condition that you're able to prescribe for and you feel comfortable to assess for that and make those changes yourself, um, that is a uh, a good way to potentially look at doing that and potentially more likely to to uh, be effective, I would say. But um, certainly there's lots of strategies and things that need to kind of be considered around how do we increase the uptake of things like that. So um, I don't want to take too much more time uh, with discussing, uh, I guess, uh, my thoughts on this, because I'm sure there's lots of thoughts from the from the crowd and here, and I'm um, very interested to hear some of the discussions, some of the things that people are thinking about. Uh, I, I do think that this is a very important topic and something that pharmacists can certainly take a larger role in. Um, and to kind of bring it back to the, to the title of this talk, is antimicrobial stewardship ready for community pharmacists? I think antimicrobial stewardship is ready for community pharmacists. The question is, are community pharmacists ready for antimicrobial stewardship? And I think um, a lot of them are, and a lot of them maybe either aren't quite there or maybe don't know that they're quite there, or maybe they don't know that they're already doing that a little bit. So, um, so I do think that this is something that's very relevant, and I hope to see um, you know, a lot more kind of done in this area, especially now that there's more places coming online with, with pharmacists being able to do this. In Canada, we are um, kind of at the cutting edge of this. There are other countries and other states that are coming online with some of these things, um, but most of them, I think, uh, you know, might be focusing more on the pharmacist initiation piece, but I think the pharmacist, which is important, as I mentioned, but I think the pharmacist optimization piece is also an important um, consideration where that's where that's possible. So again, thanks everyone for your attention on this, and I, I very much look, uh, look forward to what sort of questions or discussion might be about this topic. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Nathan, for those remarks. Um, I completely agree with you, and I think it, you know, just during Mark's presentation and your remarks, it really gets me thinking that there will probably have to be a 2.0 version of this presentation maybe in a year or so, so when we can kind of catalog um, where, where we are, um, you know, a year from this time. Um, if anyone online has any questions or comments, um, we're a pretty small group today, so I'll, I'll just welcome people to maybe unmute if they have a question or a comment for Mark or Nathan. Um, quickly, I'll mention Anne's, Ryan Resnick's comment in the chat, it seems as though the public awareness of Current antibiotic shortage is an ideal opportunity for education. <laughs> um, agree with that, Anne. Um, and, and maybe I'll just uh, put Catherine's first question in the chat forward to the group. Are physicians ready for community pharmacist-led AMS? I think that I think that this is a primary barrier to community pharmacists engaging in AMS. What do you see as some potential solutions? Mark or Nathan, uh, whoever wants to tackle that one first. I'll, I'll just put it out there and, and Nathan, please follow up. Um, you're right. We can't, we are not going to own this independently. Oh, my lights are going out. One second. Um, so, uh, we're not going to own this and nor should we have like a competitive relationship. Like this should be done collegially. And I think our test is going to be, how do we do this in a way that doesn't alienate people and doesn't ostracize people, but makes it ours. And I think when we think about stewardship barriers and, and opportunities, um, there we go. Uh, so what we think we should do is provide, you know, have things that are hard, uh, the sticks, like the indication on the prescription, it's a stick. But the carrot is like, hey, guess what I caught today? I caught, you know, this this person is getting the wrong antibiotic for this ind this indication. So really try to use a collaborative practice model or communic open communication lines to uh, facilitate this being our power alley and not something that we're automatically the cops that we're fighting back against somebody's prescribing. I really, really, really firmly believe that doing things without being the, the police is the important way to do it here. And uh, whatever that means in our individual practice settings, we have to do. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think that really underscores the importance of collaboration. Nathan. Yeah, and, and, and I agree completely. Um, but I'll just add to that sort of another way to think of this question too, is that um, does it matter if physicians are ready for community pharmacist-led AMS? Do we have to wait for their permission to do this, right? Because they're never, it seemed like, it seems like physicians generally, or at least there's a large chunk of them, they're never ready for us to do anything. Every time something comes along, they're not ready for it. And then we do it and then we show we're great at it and they come along and they'll eventually start referring patients to us. We see that in, in Alberta all the time where we have a very large uh, expanded scope of practice, right? And there's some physicians that initially are kind of hesitant and, um, and then what happens is the pharmacists do their thing they show them and they send them their documentation notes and they, they see the good job that we're doing 
And then, then they come along and then sometimes they can end up being some of our biggest supporters, which is something that we've seen with some um, surveys that we've done of, of certain pharmacists who've kind of uh, taken the ball and roll and ran with it on this. So, um, so, so I think that that is, uh, you know, kind of, kind of another way to think of it too. And um, I'll say also uh, acknowledgement to um, my, with the roadmap study co-authors, uh, Ross Yuki and Dan Smythe, but Ross often talks about um, about this as well is is why do do we need to wait for for permission to to expand our scope? Why do we let other disciplines um, decide what is and isn't in our scope? Right? Why do we let other other um, people decide that? And I think that's a really important perspective that we need to keep in mind. Um, that uh, you know, I mean, it's important to do that collaboratively and, and to have their buy-in and, and everything as well. But I don't. I, I think it's very important that we don't look at that as being, uh, don't let it become as, as big of a barrier, I guess, as, as, as it has been and, and that it could potentially be because we might be waiting forever until we actually get the full buy-in and <laughs> otherwise, so. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks, Nathan. Um, Lori, I can see you put in the chat that you have a question. If you wanna unmute yourself, feel free. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, there you go. It's uh, Lori Dunn here. I'm uh, one of the clinical coordinators for the anti-infective guidelines for community acquired infections. And so obviously one of our, well, and you pointed that out, you have to have access to proper tools and resources. And I mean, that book's been around for over 25 years. What uh, we're always worried about is why, so it's provided free through Public Health Ontario to every physician. Is there a role for you and you know, academia or in certain levels, OCP, to maybe lobby the provincial government that you can get on the list? Like, why don't pharmacists get the book free? It reminds me of the old CPS, right? And it's on all the medical residents get it free, all the nurse practitioners. So I would say, um, the, one of the facilitating factors could be get it. You have to be on the same page. Then you're going to have a lot less resistance, you know, like Warren McIsaac's scorecard, like you mentioned, the UK throat card. Well, all the um, opinion leader, family physicians and tools are in there already. So how can you move towards maybe ensuring proper, like you say, these proper tools? Yeah, Nathan, do you want to um, start? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say that that's a, that's a great point, and and I would agree that um, that 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 certainly should be made available to all prescribers uh, or all all that are going to be involved in decisions. And if it's free for some but not for others, and that's kind of um, a bit of a disservice, really, to 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 some someone who could potentially benefit from that. And I think um, perhaps in Ontario, uh, that could be a uh, there, could, there could be a case for that now that, that now that pharmacists are coming on board with prescribing antimicrobials for certain indications, that maybe they can get themselves added to that list um, because they could use the the rationale that historically they weren't prescribers, so fine, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll we'll begrudgingly let that slide. But now if they are, maybe we maybe, maybe they can make a stronger case now that 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 they should have that. And, and, that and remember as well, like you're from Saskatchewan, it was RX Files, the pharmacy group, when they would bring out the orange books to the prescribers, which obviously could include your pharmacist, right? So um, I think there's a huge role in the provision of information from pharmacists and academic detailing for that. But anyway, we won't get into that. Good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Lori. Um, well, I, I'm sort of sorry to say that we're at the end of our time for today. Um, Mark and Nathan, thank you both so much. Um, like I said, I think there will have to be a 2.0 version of this um, in the next little while and, and really appreciate the thoughtful commentary um, on such a relevant and timely, timely topic as we close out 2022. Um, Zubin, do you want to provide a few last remarks? Yep, 
just to join you in thanking our speakers today and our audience for some great questions and some great interaction, but perhaps most importantly, as this is our last CPE speaker series event for the year, to thank you and Elise for all of your leadership in organizing and facilitating these events. Please join us next year. Our CPE schedule is coming together for next year. As well, I hope to see many of you um, at our session on December the 6th, focused on environmental sustainability in pharmacy, a very important topic and one that we hope to uh, see many of you attend. Thank you all very much. Happy holidays and all the best for 2023. Thank you.